so PyCon is actually coming to close. Some of you already went home. We have like two or three last presentations to go. Um, so I'm really happy that you came to hear something about writing API for mobile. Um, so I wonder actually why are you interested in that topic? Everyone here creates API of any kind? Great, okay, about half of you. Um, and how about API for mobiles? Right, so I guess many of you would like to start or just know something about that. Um, my name is Wojtek Erbatowski, um, and if you want to provide any kind of feedback, that's my Twitter handle. Feel free to tweet me what do you think about this topic. Um, I work as a head of engineering at Polydia, and uh, Polydia is a company that is mostly building mobile apps. So actually, we are uh, about 40, uh, we have a headcount of 40, um, and about three or four backend developers providing KPIs for all of those mobile apps. Um, and we are contributed to open source, so whatever actually isn't specific to client, we're trying to um, extract that, put into open source library, document that, and use that in our project as well. We are also uh, contributing into mobile community in Warsaw. We've started mobile Warsaw, monthly meetups, and are organizing mobile Central Europe conference. Um, so, why the topic isn't just how to design a good API, but it's an API for mobile. And the main reason actually is for that. So it, when it comes to mobile, it just, everything is pretty different. Because your client now isn't in a powerful browser, but it barely can handle any kind of uh, animation and heavy load. So we will divide all um, that whole topic into three parts. Um, actually, we're going to start by looking at uh, one limitation and then uh, see what can we do about that. Let's start with latency. Probably most of you understand one way or another latency. Um, I see it uh, actually like how long does it take for data to start coming in, right? How long do I have to wait? So in um, this particular case, uh, when you are loading, well, pretty big, as for mobile, amount of data, um, it's not very painful. You just have to start for the connection to be open and then just load the data. But if you are head hitting um, often for the server or diff different endpoints, then actually latency may be even, may take even longer than actually getting the data and cal calculating that on the server. Um, so actually, let's take a walk through some of the data. This was something we've gathered in the center of Warsaw on a couple of different um, connections, starting actually in our office um, and with a Mac, uh, I think that was the middle uh, 2011 MacBook Pro. Um, so actually, if you start with a Wi-Fi, that's a pretty amazing uh, ping going down uh, right there under one millisecond. But the average was slightly about three milliseconds. Um, I guess that the most important for us is the average and the standard deviation. So you can see. How often do you actually go far from your average? If that's pretty low, then developing something and testing the connection, you can actually test only for uh, the average. If standard, uh, standard deviation um, is pretty high, then you actually have to test both cases when it's, uh, it, it goes lower be below the average and uh, higher above that. And the last two uh, our download speed in uh, megabits 
um, and upload speed. So as you can see, that's a pretty good connection we have in our office. And if you just use a mobile and the same Wi-Fi in the same place, it goes like 10, 10 times worse already. Um, so what it means actually, uh, there's a worse modem for Wi-Fi in your mobile device than in your laptop. And it causes already latency to be uh, way bigger. But that's a good Wi-Fi. Let's move to LTE. Um, so uh, most actually describe that as 4G connection. So that's the most uh, popular, actually, I guess, in that room. Who of you has LTE in his mobile device? Bridgie? Two? All right. That's good. So actually, if you take a look at that, it's actually um, pretty uh, good comparing to even Wi-Fi. And if you think that about 90 milliseconds uh, average ping time is bad, then let's move on. 3G, right? So it, it, it's actually this stands uh, in for mobile operators sell this one as 3G. Most of the cases. Look how bad actually. Well, we don't have to look at the uh, maximum, but the standard deviation is actually you cannot. Think of the average as something that you should test against anymore. And if you go for 2G, well, you don't. Who uses that, right? We'll see who, who uses that, actually. Who of you know what HDOAS is? Really? Oh, okay. Um, so when you are building RESTful API and you think it's RESTful and you actually go deeper into the knowledge, into the theory, you're going to um, see this pattern as a REST on steroids. And it tells you, like, well, first of all, start using hypermedia to connect entities in your API. Don't just describe your endpoints. If something is connected, just like in here, um, to the address, you can just uh, provide a reference for that. So someone will actually call uh, the other endpoint. Um, this is great, definitely, for describing your API. Someone wants to learn that, discover, and, and use your API, you can just use the starting point as here for a user. And if he wants additional data, he can use links. You can provide operations as link. So if you want to delete this entity, just hit this endpoint. And if you want to add another one or create a, a relation, use this one. Um, yeah, so actually, we're starting by going for a user, then get a relation. And here, you have additional data. So let's say that you actually um, want to on your mobile applications, you don't have as much space uh, uh, as in your browser. So you will not be able to display everything. You just want to display name, age, and country. Someone goes. So you go for a list of uh, people, then actually hit um, the first entity and call another one. So how to solve that, actually? Well, Let's say that you know who your client is, and you know what's the applica what the application is going to be. And then you can actually prepare API just for this application. You can merge response just to contain all of the data that will be needed in that single view. So application may actually just do one call instead of several. This may sound obvious. But actually, most of APIs that we've been dealing with was developed as, 
word of up as um, uh, as API for uh, JavaScript in browser. And then someone only just added few things needed for mobile device, and it used uh, was used for both of them. But if you don't know who the client will be, because you're just providing API for your service, there's another mechanism for you, and it it's called expansion. Let's zoom in. Actually, to the data and, and to get everything that you need in just one request, you're providing fields. That's uh, actually part of this pattern to call it fields and then say, what do you want to get? But you can actually go deeper in another level and API will call another entity, fill it up for you and give you in this single request. There are some problems with that, actually. So let's say that you have generic API, and how do you actually handle that kind of parameter? It means a lot of actually manual checking what did actually come with that and how deep you have to go in your entities to load that. There are, uh, in most of uh, popular frameworks, there are no automatic uh, out-of-the-box mechanisms for that. And the most, most important part, actually, clients on both Android and iOS, by default now, use Keep Alive connection. All you have to do is just make sure your server actually supports that. They will try to make all of the requests in just a single open connection. HATOAS was actually about documenting APIs. And if, if you take that away, and optimize the API, you have to give something in return. So well, yesterday I was actually presenting uh, Swagger in more, more details, but if someone cannot actually discover your API by simply playing with that, you need to provide some kind of simple documentation for him. That's a nice trick. The second limitation is throughput. And now you can actually see that it's not really great. If you take a look uh, on the world map, uh, uh, basic throughput on mobile, average mobile connection speed. Where are your clients? Do you know that? Well, it should be. <laughs> Yeah, some of you don't have clients and don't have those problems. But if you do, um, the first question you should actually ask is, where are my clients? Is it only the application for Poland? So I can actually think that they will be somewhere in between those numbers. Um, maybe in States or in Europe, then fine. But if your application is actually worldwide and you want to uh, be able to provide at least fair uh, quality for your uh, customers. Think about that. It's less than one megabit on your connection. If you start loading data to a mobile device, will you actually um, test that against that kind of connection? Uh, this comes from actually uh, Cisco analysis and it's, I think, way too small for you to see. So, on the left hand, this kind of state of the art right now. And as you can see, it goes with 2G worldwide being almost two thirds of all traffic. And almost half of you had like a 4G connection right now. You are in those 3% of the worldwide actually, traffic connection. And if you want to make your application to work well only on 4G, then you're going to have to wait another five years, four years, to reach half of the market. So the answer is pretty short to 
whether you should care or not, definitely for several more years. All right. Um, again, we have this example uh, for actually, uh, this is pretty close to something that we actually got from one client. This, this is the API that the mobile application is using, was using back then. And it has a lot, a lot of information in here. And you will never show that in the mobile application because there is not enough room for that kind of information. Well, this is actually um, pretty easy to start with. You can trim the data, provide only something that will be needed to, to be displayed or used in the mobile application. And it seems very trivial, actually, to say that, but none of the APIs that we've been dealing with, you had that. Mostly, you are just providing entities that you have in your relational database. So if you think as a user, as an entity of 20 or 40 fields, you're just gonna send that to the customer, to the client, um, just like that. Well, use gzip, definitely, because if you have a lot of data and just like that, that's uh, actually, uh, I've changed that just slightly to show you uh, examples from real APIs and you can go down by 85% just enabling GZIP and why wouldn't you? Well, first of all, you might be afraid that the mobile connection will not support GZIP, right? Both of, the, uh, both of main platforms do out of the box using simply um, libraries for that. Um, so you don't have to wonder. On the other hand, there is just one important argument for you not to use GZIP. If you have some endpoints that return a small amount of data and you do that very often, then GZIP needs to build a dictionary in it and Use, doing that, actually, it will increase data size you have to send and will cost you additional time for computation. Expansion, we already seen that. But now let's take a look at, at how can one just limit the data he's getting. So you can have a generic API, but you can let the client decide what, what you are going to send. This seems nice. Some public APIs like Facebook actually can let you decide what do you want to get from it. On the other hand, like Django, Flask, no one supports that out of the box. It's something that you have to write for your entities and it's not easy actually to make that into, uh, in a library. If you wonder ever that well, no developers want to make APIs in XML. Some customers do. They think it's like, I don't know, more stable, more German. I don't know. Um, you can actually start um, with this argument that, well, definitely the same data written in XML will be bigger than in JSON unless you are using gzip because everything will be in the dictionary and then the difference is close to nothing actually so you don't have to worry about that all right another thing important in developing mobile applications is that the toolbox is very very limited. And if you take a look at how wide the technology radar for backend development is, it's just like tens of languages. Every language has tens of different web frameworks and lots of lots of libraries doing exactly what you want, what you want to do. 
On the other hand, on mobile, let's say that you want to make two requests for two different services and then um, actually join those answers. You can do that in parallel um, and save that. What are you going to do? Bigger again. So this is iOS code. You have to declare a couple of objects. One for loading data from one service, um, and then another for another service. You have to encapsulate them in tasks, so we can actually then execute them. And another task that will wait for those two to be finished and then actually you can join those responses into one and use it to save uh, into the database. Let's see Android. All right, Android system supports actually multitasking as well. Um, it's actually not that different, and it's pretty nice because it already uses a library that encapsulates what system provides you. So it reads nice, so you can actually load one thing and another, and then when it's done, you can actually think about the results, and then you would actually have to care what happens in system kills one of your tasks, because it can if resources, if resources are actually pretty much used. And it's not in here, right? I guess I'm missing one slide actually for Python, but you're just gonna have to imagine how short would that be, actually. Um, sorry for that. Well, whenever you do something like that, then you want to test that. And when it comes to testing, it sucks on mobile devices. First of all, when you want to run uh, on Android some unit tests, you're gonna have to develop one, deploy your application to the device, then deploy another application, test application, that will test the main one and wait for the results. So a simple unit test may actually ta take up to 30 seconds, two minutes, then you go make a simple fix and do all, all of that again. You can do that locally with some ugly hacks, but when it comes actually to reality, this was the most popular plugin for testing Android code. And it's deprecated. If you want to read that, what's below? The Google team is just changed the build system so often that every plugin actually gets deprecated by every single small release. And we were actually developing our plugin and lately we've dropped that as well. It's way easier to do that on the backend. Let's do that on the backend. So another thing you actually spot a bug in the application, a small one. You can fix that fast and then submit that to the store. If it's Android, it's, it's gonna take just a couple of hours to be there. If it's iOS, it can take several weeks. But no one actually sees that your clients will not update right of the way. Just some of them, well, probably most of you do, you just want to check your email right now, not update your application. So you just swipe the notification about potential updates and do 20 of them once a month. All right. Um, sorry. Let's go with this one. Um, so the more logic you have on the mobile device, the more you have to test the more bugs will get to your production, the more fixes you're gonna release. Move as much as you can logic to the backend 
and provide API as close to what actually happens on the mobile device as possible. So it starts very simple. This right here is what you would call a RESTful API. You don't say, hey, follow, I want, I'm this user, I want to follow another user. For a RESTful API, you should use entities. So you're creating a relation, like a following symbol, saying from who to who. Now, you can actually go a little bit um, you can do it a little bit different, but that's not going to be strict REST. You can make a post for another user saying, follow that user. I, you already know who I am because I am authenticated, right? Providing no data. So going away from strict REST and using verbs instead of nouns, you can be close to operations that someone actually do, uh, that someone does uh, on the... Uh, mobile device. So if someone clicks a single button, that's usually actually translates a single call to the backend. Probably uh, you can even obtain some data. And some other problems, versioning. Um, sooner or, or later, you're going to have to do that. And there are three most popular ways. First of all, and you probably know this one already, let's start a path right after the host name with the version number. This is quite easy to understand and see, yet this is violating REST because now you, your path doesn't specify your entity, it does something else also. It specifies the version of API. So this is actually um, uncommon for uh, very strict REST. This is the most restful way of doing versioning. You are usually using media types, specifying that you, you want to have JSON, um, but in this particular version. So if you actually change that, from one version of backend to another, someone will still be using the old media type. You will provide what was actually under that type some time ago. And the last one, this is actually my favorite. It lets you actually create the whole backend application in different version. So you are, you are actually changing the whole service. The old one is still running if someone uses that, and if you have several um, applications running for, uh, for handle the whole traffic, then you can actually switch them to new version uh, on, on the same time that user, uh, users are actually um, updating their applications. The problem with that is that you have two separate applications working on the same resource. So if you want to migrate your database, you're going to have to do that the way both applications will be working. And if you spot a bug in one of them and want to fix that, you're going to have to fix that bug in all of the running applications. Um, one thing actually I've read over the internet, actually the, the best way to do that is not to change your API. I couldn't agree more. You just have to think what it's going to be. HTTP cache, you could wonder actually, browser does that, will mobile device? Well, not out of the box, but all of the most popular libraries keep cache on, the, on local storage. So they will save um, all of the uh, responses that your server is sending locally. So if you just add this single support for caching, you just save a bunch of code responsible for caching on local. One does not have to check actually whether uh, it's already um, 
the data is uh, old enough actually to make another response he can just hit the response and he, his library will say like okay the last response didn't even expire yet so i will just um, show the last result for that those are our uh, most popular libraries for both ios and android that support caching paging well we used to do paging for web applications for a completely different reason as for mobile apps. Yet we mostly, most of the cases, we do that in the same way. Paging for a web application is just something, someone is not probably going uh, under 1,000 results. He just wants 20, probably he never uh, will look on another page. And if he does, he gets another. Uh, 20 maybe he wants to increase that if he's actually scanning a lot of information not on the mobile device if you would scroll for 20 results and have to wait until another page is loaded you will just uninstall that application sooner that it will load that another page and there is a, another problem so what applica mobile applications do is just they load a bunch of page uh, of pages that they can store locally and then if you scroll down and get close to the end they will actually load more data so you actually might never see actually that this is being loaded it just seems like an infinite collection but if they do let's say that um, this is a simple scenario someone loads the first page then you delete a single record and mobile application goes then for second page what it will get right well the second page will be just like that and someone will actually never see this record because mobile application will not ask you again for all, all the pages on web application you will just hit refresh and uh, it will be on the first page. So, don't ask mobile developers to handle that and maybe ask whether another page didn't change but that time or something. Just create a URL at the end of every collection saying that, well, this is your next page. If it's empty, if it's not here, then it's your last page. But if you ask for that, you will get all of the results after the last one you, you've got on this page. The second thing is start by actually thinking whether you need paging. If your data it con actually consists, I don't know, 1,000 records or maybe 10,000 records, so that's like, I don't know, megabyte. If you use, um, if you're going to use gzip, that's going to be, a, well, maybe 50 kilobytes, maybe 100 kilobytes. That's something that mobile application will handle, will just load. If you don't have that much data to send, just don't use paging. Give everything to the mobile device. On the other hand, let them decide what the page size is going to be if it's, um, if it's very big. Right. In the end, um, this is something actually that when you apply all of that theory into a real life pro problem, you could think like, okay, we don't have to optimize uh, that much. The application is quite fluid. So we were getting application for a company called Utest. Now they are named Applause and being one of the sponsors of the conference. And they are so cool that they actually let us tell about internals of their applications uh, to share that we've done that, done some optimizations for them. Um, and they had legacy API built for the web browser. Mobile application was using that. It was quite slow. And at some point of time, actually, they let us do some optimizations on the backend side as well. 
Um, and definitely, uh, actually, they are. Uh, this is quite important. The application is for is worldwide. They have testers across um, the whole planet. And then, if you build a web applic uh, mobile application, then you can actually ask them to test that in several different countries by different people or on different devices. So it's important to work on uh, a bunch of different. Uh, samples. Those are the results. There were 36 used endpoints in the application. Well, we just went down to 20, which means that 16 of them were always used in the same context that something else. So we just merged that together. If you go for the whole application just to touch every single functionality, you would make 86 requests, and we just went down to 20. Like every single page, uh, every single view in the mobile application just needs one call right now, just to fetch the data it needs. And without just using gzip, we went down with data by 84%. That's the whole crazy data never used in the mobile applications that used to be sent. But talk is cheap. Let's see how it works. So this is actually screen from iPad being recorded. There's the old version of application. I think it is. No, it's the actually, this is the old one. And we have just at one point of time moved to new API, optimized one. So you can see. Um, two of them, and to see the differences, if something, if, if one operation uh, operation will be finished um, on the faster application, it will pause, wait for another one. So this is how it looks. You start by logging in, and by logging in, you get a bunch of information to configure the whole application for the first time. And I mean a lot of application, a lot of data was being sent in the old application, right? Okay, then you go through the tutorial, so that's pretty fast because it's offline, and then you wait on the main screen for all that data to come from server, and it was not actually being ready to display. You had some raw data that you ha had to calculate locally to be able to display. That's a huge difference for those two views. It's a little bit smaller on smaller screens. Yet you need a couple of more seconds actually to finish the flow. And then maybe it's not that big difference in several other screens here. What's the user experience for using both of those applications, right? Every single time, you're just going to have to wait for like 15 seconds to load the main screen to use the application. So your application might be smooth. Do everything in the back and not lock your screen. But if you're just going to have to wait a long time for data, it's not going to be great. And the last part is actually that you could think, well, we, we have also optimized the way that we are obtaining the data from the database, and it's faster on the back end. Well, we have just built a facade. We are using the old API, translate that, throw away all of the data that, not being, uh, that is not used in the mobile application, and then send that to application. So it could be even slower than the original one, but you've all seen the result, right? This is it. I hope you like this example. Maybe you have some questions. Hi, just one question regarding gzip encryption, uh, sorry, uh, compression here. Uh, did you notice any battery drain or 
CPU usage uh, penalty associated with using it on a big scale? Um, no, no, I haven't actually. That was like un, uh, after um, GCPing the data was a couple of maybe tens kilobytes to load. That's that wasn't really a big amount of data. How about you? Did you notice that? Uh, I did notice that, but it was pre-Android. Uh, old Windows phones uh, were really working slower because their hardware wasn't so great for using GZIP. Yeah, that's thanks. why I'm asking. Thanks for that, actually. That's worth checking. Okay, thanks. Hi, actually, uh, two things. Uh, one to notice, uh, maybe there are people who don't know it, uh, the newest Chrome beta have really good development tools where you can test site with uh, with the internet speed you, you would like. So you can test 2G, 3G, 4G, and you can test how the page loads then. And th that's quite fine. Uh, and my question about uh, pagination, uh, you have said about this since approach, uh, but this has one major drawback because when you dele delete the scenes record then you, you can have 10 pages you are on the page one you delete the last uh, the last one from this page you go to page two and you, there is no scenes so you're on the last page there are no records so how do you handle that well the scenes was actually the timestamp of uh, last element in that collection so if you delete like everything before next that you were supposed to get, it's not a number of item that you are supposed okay, to get. Okay, it's not, not an ID. Yes. It was like the time stop of last change. So if you want to send something for the device, will you will just keep data ordered by this timestamp and send everything that you are supposed to send from that point of time. Okay. Uh, can you recommend some further reading for somebody who wants to learn to make backends for mobile uh, mobile applications? No, I have no idea for that. But I will get you a book. It's a Python high-performance programming, and it's really thin, so it must be really easy to do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Gary. Okay, no more questions. Thank you very much. See you next year.